Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Elisa Lebo, I teach film studies at the University of Sussex, and with me are two of the producers of the film that you just saw. It's an amazing film they made, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Impressive. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever your thoughts are, it's clearly a major labor of, of uh, uh, sort of committed um, political vision. So, I don't know, how many of you are aware of the difference between the director and the producer in a documentary? Often it's the same person. Um, but I thought maybe we could just start, since we have people here um, who really put that work into it, by hearing what it means to have produced a work like this and kind of what the relationship is between you and uh, Laura Poitras, who's a very, you know, well-known filmmaker and a, a big presence, I guess, in this film, but also as a filmmaker. Thank you. Well, thank you, first of all, uh, to Doc House for having us, for everyone to, uh, coming out to see the film, and thank you, Elisa. Um, well, I think we'll, you know, we'll share the mic, we'll do a two-part answer, but, um, uh, Laura, as many people might know, or, or might, she's a producer in her own right, um, and she, she's produced many of her own films, and she's a producer on this film, um, but it's obviously um, always better to do things as a team, and so as a team of producers, we were able to, um, I came on in the, in the post-production process, and so there's assembling that team, finding editors, post-production, um, color, sound, uh, there's also, you know, it, as a team, um, watching rough cuts and, and having, you know, uh, um, the process of, of creating the story, uh, of being able to create space to create the story, of finding the right people, um, and uh, yeah, and then getting the film out, um, and you know, getting the film out in the U.S. and, and internationally, um, and that whole process can can take a while. We were really pleased that the film could come out so quickly in the U.K. following the the U.S. release say you can probably tell from the credits and we'll probably talk about this a little bit this is a film many many years in the making so from from 2010 and actively from 2011 so that's six seven years which isn't actually that unusual in documentary feature film but it's quite quite long so there are many people who've been involved and there were many people who were producing on Katie Scoggin and others um, who've been involved in the film over the years. I, I worked with Laura on Citizen Four at the tail end of that film, and we worked together with her um, on her recent art exhibition at the Whitney Museum of Art, and then Laura decided to return to this material um, in, in 2015, and so that was when we you know, began actively in this project. So that's you know, three to four years after um, principal photography started. So. These are processes that go on um, and involve everything from raising funds to, I like the way you said that actually, about creating creating the space to allow the work to, to continue to allow the editor and, and the director um, the space they needed. And then in this case, to go through the um, ups and downs that a, a project like this would inevitably have. Uh, but you do it with lots and lots of people. It's one of the things I like about working in film. You work with incredible distribution teams and with, there's, you know, a whole sets of people, which is why those credits are so long. <laughs> yeah, and people sat through them, which is great. <laughs> Always sit through credits, that's what I tell my students. Um, so I don't know how many of you are aware this film premiered, or a version of this film premiered at Cannes a year ago. Um, and the film that you saw is quite a different film, as I understand it, from what screened at Cannes. So I'm going to ask, I haven't seen the Cannes version, so I'm going to ask, and I don't know if any of you have seen the Cannes version. One person here, <laughs> Ali Harbottle, who's down in his right. seat from Dogma. Very few people saw yes. it. This con is a, um, the Cannes Film Festival is almost what we would call press and industry screening. It's, it's, it's pretty much closed to the public. There are some, right, there are some uh, public screenings, but so there, there are very few people who, who saw that film. Um, so what are the differences? What, what changed and what, why did it have to change? 
So we can do that in two parts. You want to do the good, good yeah. But um, well, so we uh, we began um, going back to the footage um, that Laura had had been shooting, and that let me just let me go back to the beginning to say that um, Laura Portress was making what she felt was going to be a trilogy. Her first film in two thousand six, and this was a nine eleven trilogy about sort of. America, really, as American filmmaker in the post-9-11 period. So the first film was um, My Country, My Country, about the occupation and war in Iraq that she shot there, which, as it turns out, was what landed her in on you know the terror watch list and was why she was detained um, at borders more than 50 times from 2006 until 2012. Uh, her second film was uh, started about Guantanamo and ended up filming in Yemen about sort of this that side of the war on terror. So the third film she called the to, Oath, right? Yeah, called the Oath. Thank you. That came out in 2010, and um, she had always planned for the third part of the trilogy to be about journalism and sort of a little bit of the consequences of of the of 9/11 and and the wars and the kind of surveillance state and all of which I think she was quite prophetic even on the serial state. So she was filming with Glenn Greenwald, who you see in the beginning of Citizen Four, um, uh, Jacob Applebaum, who you see in this film, and wanted, when she, like many of us, learned about WikiLeaks in 2012 when Collateral Murder came out, was really taken by the fact, it's hard to remember now, but I don't know how many of you feel this way, but the kind of coverage that was happening about the war in Iraq, there was very little, at least in the American press. And that was why Collateral Murder and Chelsea Manning's you know, release um, her her whistleblowing, courageous whistleblowing activity was so, you know, huge at that moment. This was many, many years in. So I, I just give that background to the con answer to say that she was in the process of making a film, then returned to it after um, the Snowden story, which is a <laughs> story, and we worked on a film. Uh, we we took it to con. It was we were done. Um, although I will say. You know, we had a sense that that there would be some things we were going to have to change. We were already at that point um, under incredible pressure, um, and I would say a form of censorship, attempted censorship from WikiLeaks, going into Khan. Uh, I mean, do you want to talk about really the motivation around Applebaum? I mean, I should say that so we knew we had to make some changes, but what we did not realize was the extent of those of of those changes, and it was the story of of the accusations, the uh, allegations made against Jacob Applebaum, which was, what, two weeks after the Khan Film Festival. That was the turning point So us. you had meetings where you really had to reckon with what you had just shown and what you were going to do. Yeah, it was, a, it was an absolute, it was a, a, a bombshell for us. And we either were going to, I think Laura has said this publicly, and I think we all felt this way, we were either going to shelve the film we felt we could not ethically show that film that we had shown because we did not deal with we couldn't we couldn't it was before we couldn't deal with those that storyline which is not to say we knew the 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 truth or the lack of truth of it but just that it was a major story um, or we would have to address it how to address it then became the struggle of the next year as we were trying to understand how we were going to address that uh, yet another story of potentially of power and abuse and of different kinds and also unfolding on the internet. Then the US election um, story happened and WikiLeaks was back on the front page, the New York Times, which believe you me, that was not the case when we were going into con. So that then again, um, which is not uncommon in documentary, but we can so go if on WikiLeaks on. goes back into the news in six months' time, will you have to cut the film again? <laughs> or is this it? Please, no. Okay. <laughs> Yoni, maybe you have something else to add here. Yeah, well, I think uh, on that note as well, I mean, the, the film hadn't yet been distributed. And so it's a different, you know, now the film is, is out here. Um, and it's, it, it's, I think people understand when they've seen the film that that's, that's the case. But to have the film come out, if if the film had come out after Khan without dealing with, um, with the the sexual assault allegations um, against Applebaum, uh, given the the that he's a character in the film and that there is already uh, a through line, a storyline, um, 
in that in that vein in the film is is difficult. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know the film was made over six, almost seven years, and and the film you know morphs over that time constantly. And does anyone want to tell us what the differences are aside from the new? Uh, obviously, you couldn't have had things about the Jake, right. yeah. Jacob Applebaum uh, or Trump, for that matter. Right. But it yeah. can't be. It wasn't just add-on. It wasn't a a postscript, which I think is the conventional way to handle the new mm -hmm. bits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what's so interesting about the film is that so much of it is actually the same, and that it's really a lot of it is the co is the context of watching the film. And so there is, of course, um, the, the the ending is quite different, given that. Trump hadn't been elected, um, the, the election hadn't happened, and so there's all this new content at the end, but that also adds a new context where um, the internet and, and leaks are a force that is also has a quite, can have a quite dark effect on our world, and I think that watching it in that sense, feel, having that in the film and having that also in our world, when you watch it, it feels very different. Um, and so I think there's, there's the addition of the, the last perhaps a uh, chapter or the last act that takes place in, in 2016, but there's also the addition of that context and that framing um, that changes so much of it. Right. Yeah. So I think from a formal perspective, you know, just a lot of discussion about this film has been about uh, the, the context and, and the way it was made and then about some uh, disagreements. Um, but the... Laura um, is a, what is called a cinema verite filmmaker, an observational filmmaker, for the most part. Um, the the, the two-camera interview that is kind of tent post through the, through the film with Assange is actually relatively unusual. She's done some of that in some of her other films, uh, for sure, in, in Citizen Four, the main act of the film. But um, what the key element that was not in um, in the premiere of the film at Cannes was the narration, Laura's production journals. And that did not come about as a creative decision until very, very late in the process. It's not something that most, I don't know you as, you're a filmmaker as well, most filmmakers, directors do not want to go to that. That is not their, f especially not a, a cinema verite. Yeah, it's not their first meant choice. to be a personal film, unless right. it's meant to be a first-person film. And I think Citizen Four had a bit of that because of the email, well, right. the coded and encrypted right. communications, I guess they're not called emails, um, that were going on. And there's, you know, so her presence is important in that film, but it's, nobody would call it a first-person film. And this one comes much has become, closer. Has be, exactly. And I would say with Citizen Four, we absolutely had that same struggle. That was a, a, a major push with the, the editor um, to understand how to deal with that. You know, so it's hard for people to remember that Laura Poitras wasn't just the director. She was the journalist, right? He was her source. So it was complicated in that sense in Citizen Four. And here as well, the story is entwined, right? Her, her story with Snowden in, entwines with... Assange, they're related. So we, we went to this formal device of the production journal um, and the narration very, very late. Um, and I remember, you know, Ollie was asked, kept asking, can I see the new film? We're like, no, not yet. We're, st we're still working on it. Um, and it, uh, it, yeah, it was something we really wrestled with. Um, and then, of course, we wrestled when it became even more, you know, it's, it goes from from production journal to very personal revelations, and that was another level um, of wrestling. And it does change the film, but I think we felt, and we felt the audience needed a, some a, a outside observation to what is a very tight and closed and claustrophobic film, which is obviously the experience of Assange. He was he was under detention and, and remains to this day in a very, very tight atmosphere, and we felt that in the film. This was w some way to bring us out um, to kind a of little oxygenate bit. oxygenate a little bit. But even then, I mean, the, the production journal is quite... Yeah, and Laura's in that whisper tone. She tense, has. And, and it's a struggle. The whole the whole thing is kind of a struggle, right? Yeah, it's not, it's not a comfortable uh, film in that sense. So are we going to talk about the Newsweek... I promise. Situation. <laughs> uh, this, I mean, this film, I'm sure you watched it and felt like it 
must have been finished yesterday, right? I mean, it's about all the things that we're hearing about and dealing with, um, really, at, at the in the minute, um, including the controversy that uh, his, WikiLeaks is perpetuating, basically. I'm, I'm hoping that actually um, helps whip up an audience for the film, to be honest. I like when these things backfire, but... Um, but there take just good marketing would be great. Yeah, okay, <laughs> that's true. Would be preferable. I'm sure it's taking years off of all of your lives. But <laughs> but can we talk a little bit about the pushback from the WikiLeaks legal team and the way in which they are, I guess, essentially trying to discredit the film and what and how you're handling that because it's obviously a tremendous amount of pressure. Well, I would say it's, sim it's not simply discredited, it's attempted censorship and that's what a cease and desist letter is, um, it's, uh, which have been sent to the U.S. distributors um, and probably others soon uh, to, to prevent the film from being seen. So let, let me just back up and say we can talk about it, I'm sure people have questions, but um, uh, before every public showing of the film, because this film has had different iterations. We, we screened the film, which um, we showed uh, the film, or you know, cuts of the film to, to many people uh, in, in the film. It's not only, not only WikiLeaks, but a, a lot of people who are in the film, and took their notes, and took those notes very seriously, and some of those notes were, were, you know, were insightful, some were points of correction, of fact, which is often the case. Um, and some were, uh, uh, from our perspective, very much about image management. And Assange wanted the specific scenes in the film um, removed, where he talks about the Swedish case, which I should say was not the film that Laura set out to make. She even says that. She says that very clearly, yeah. She wanted to make a film about journalism. So um, uh, that that was obviously not something we were willing to do. I don't think most directors are going to be willing to, to censor their films. Um, we had certainly had an agreement Laura had early on with uh, WikiLeaks um, at the time in 2011 that if somebody didn't want to be filmed at the time when we were filming, she would she would either not film them or direct the camera another way or, or disguise their uh, appearance. So there were some people in the version of the film in Khan who were uh, obscured. obscured. So, um, but that wasn't enough. So, um, un it's very unfortunate. We find it um, sad and obviously quite contradictory for an organization that is dedicated, as we believe it is, dedicated to press freedom and additionally to transparency. Um, these are the words of Assange, and they have, nobody has ever said that these were misedited or misrepresent what he said. Um, and. I'm not surprised, given that many, many bridges have been burned. We are not the first to be in this position with this organization. Um, and I will say, myself, and I think I could you know, certainly speak for Laura on this, um, because we responded to some of what they've said, we unequivocally um, support press freedom as well with WikiLeaks. I unequivocally support their right to publish accurate and newsworthy and, and information of public interest, which I think they have in some cases, not in all cases, um, in their history as an organization. Um, and I would hope that they would unequivocally uh, support our right to also um, publish honest and accurate. Um, and we have great music and our stuff too. So. Okay. <laughs> Yoni, do you want to add to that? Um, I think Brenda did a, a great job and covered it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just say that we we really do think that you know they have they have the right to publish true and newsworthy information, and, and the film is here, and people should you know have the the right to watch it uh, and to come up with their you know and have the right to uh, look at everything else in the public record and you know come to their own conclusions, uh, which is what we hope people do you know in general with journalism. I think this film goes well beyond journalism. I mean, it's really an impressive. Um, piece of filmmaking. I'd like to open it up to questions. I'm sure people have some. Okay, first the uh, man. Well, we're, we're going to wait for oh, the oh, mic sorry. to get to. I, I, it sounds okay. like you have a good, strong voice. But we'll <laughs> um, all right, I, I, as a filmmaker, I have quite a number of questions. Um, and I'm not sure whether they're all complimentary or not. But I guess my overall question is, at this point in time, when an audience 
goes to the screening, who is not a sophisticated audience, who is not a journalist or someone who follows the news regularly, what do you want people to come away with? And the second part is more of a filmmaker's question. And it seems to me that if there was a pro producer's journal in the documentary, that Laura should have been on camera. And, and whether you had that discussion or not, because to me, it was kind of an ethereal observation, um, rather than giving any more insight into the dynamics of the production. But the most important question I do have is, is the question of what you want the audience to, what's the takeaway? So the first thing I would say is, um, for me, audiences are sophisticated. I, I, think, I think audiences are always, all audiences, honestly, I, I strongly believe us are always um, have incredible insight into films, into theater, into poetry, into um, so I don't I don't think it's a question of like the sophisticated audience versus the other. But to speak to directly to your question, what do we want people to take away from this film? Clearly, the film is a film of contradictions, of compromises, of questions, of trying to interrogate issues of of betrayal of. The relationship between the director and the subject, um, and it's certainly more open-ended. Uh, I would say I don't think it definitively answers um, some of the things that we hoped to raise. We certainly hoped that people would, as we had to come to terms with questions of abuse and particularly gendered. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is not a neutral story on on gender, on 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 sexual uh, uh, power. And we felt that this is something that we needed to address, um, and we're certainly not the only people who've done that, but we felt that that was uh, an important part of the film from the very beginning, uh, from the beginning of this sort of secondary process, not from the beginning of when Laura started filming. So that part of it's important, but I, I hope that people will come away from this film thinking seriously about the questions that we all face about information, um, uh, how what how, what journalism means in the age where we have mass leaks, possibly um, with you know and and state actors involved. I don't mean that I believe necessarily that who I don't know who uh, like WikiLeaks is source. Yeah, <laughs> but I think but I think that's an incredibly important and interesting question that we as a society are going to have to deal with um, in upcoming elections. I was very interested to read actually. Uh, I can't remember where I was reading this about the role of the Chaos Computer uh, uh, Club, who we thank um, here in the credits, um, who are based, it's sort of a, a hacker collective based out of um, Hamburg in Germany, and their role and what they're doing, thinking about hacks um, for the upcoming German election. That I thought was fascinating, and those are the kinds of things I think um, we hope the film will address, but also I don't want to lose sight of that story about um, abuse of power and sexual dynamics in organizations we work in as somebody who's a political activist I would say in social movements and other kinds of workplaces it's something we deal with a lot um, on the second I mean maybe Yoni can have it I to me it works better as audio narration sure I mean you're a filmmaker you can make the film <laughs> you know yourself it, it wasn't it wasn't we never considered it having Laura on camera she would never have ever done it yeah, I also, I, I think um, given that that's, that's her nature, there's not a lot of footage of her on camera. <laughs> we, you know, we watched a lot of, uh, a lot of footage. Um, yeah, and so, and, and, and like Brenda said, I mean, it's a choice that people, you know, different people make different choices, but I think that the, the narration, you know, ethereal uh, was the word that you used, and I think that there's, there's multiple ways of looking at that. So ethereal could be a way where, you know, in a certain sense, it is, it's not narration in the sense of a film where the narrator is telling you, you know, what is happening. It's a narration in the sense of, um, in a way, she's with the audience, uh, I hope, or we, you know, when I think about it, that she um, is, you know, she went from being an observer uh, to a participant um, in, some, in, in some ways in the film, and so, um, you know, by not having not been a participant, that there's a reason that she wasn't pointing the camera at herself, um, you know, when when filming, and especially in those first uh, few years, and to then, you know, then 
we had to find a way, um, and, and luckily she had kept this journal to, to um, bring her voice into the film. And I think the other takeaway, it, you know, I think Brenda spoke really well to this. I mean, I think the film, I hope, works on two levels. It's a specific story about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, who are incredibly significant historically. And you know, there's there's a lot of content out there about him and about WikiLeaks uh, for that for that reason. And so I think. Um, hopefully this film can add to that body of work and can give another uh, another view and, and people you know will watch it for that specific reason and then for the broader reason that makes it perhaps um, a, a film that hopefully can inform us in all in, yeah, in all avenues of our lives in terms of this yeah, power and sexism in the workplace in social movements um, and in general in our daily lives and in politics um, not just in social movements but in, in established politics thank you I think there was a question all the way in the back. Uh, and Hi, I wanted to ask a question about um, this dynamic between uh, Assange and uh, Laura. Um, like going into it, what, what do you? Why did he invite her in to do the film? And then I wasn't clear kind of when his attitude towards her shifted. Was it that she was asking difficult questions? Was it that he knew that she was pursuing the uh, alleged uh, sexual assault narrative? Like what? Yeah, I just, I just, there wasn't like a moment where I thought, oh, okay, well that's shifted and it's because of that reason. I don't know, maybe the film's meant to make me ask these questions, but I just... Are you also asking because she says, I don't know why he... Yeah, he, he, he doesn't like He doesn't seem to like, I don't know why he trusts me. Did going into it, she think that, or did something change? That's fair. Uh, interesting question. I was gonna, so the, f the f one thing to say, just because I think it's always a, it's such a great and interesting question, always for documentary filmmakers of you know, access, the trouble of access. So Laura contacted, um, reached out to WikiLeaks in 2010, right away after the very soon after the um, uh, collateral murder. I think they you know they were kind of busy, and she was they didn't really pay much attention to her. Um, uh, but eventually, um, she was in contact um, with Charlotte Cook who was an executive producer on the film, who at the time was running the film program at the Frontline Club. And Laura knew, um, uh, was in, you know, cl quite close to WikiLeaks because they were doing their press Charlotte. conferences. Charlotte knew. Charlotte knew, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Charlotte knew WikiLeaks um, and then uh, uh, knew Laura's work and knew WikiLeaks, so helped, helped that. And, and for good reason, obviously that was quite complicated and they weren't just gonna allow anybody in and they made, you know, there were certain agreements they made to have somebody come in. I, I think we can't speak to Assange's, you know, his feelings um, and how he thought about her. I think she had a sense that it was complicated right from the beginning. Um, I think going back to production journals helped Laura remember that it was complicated for her too, but you, you maybe, I would say, you shut some of that out in order to keep going in, in film. You, you want to be able to stay in the film, so you you stay in as much as you can and you document. And then when you come out into the edit room, you have a chance to say like, what the hell, just, <laughs> what did I just witness? Um, although I think she herself would say that uh, as she documented at the time, she was amazed often by you know some of what uh, you know was said or, um, as and Kirsten Johnson, who was filming with her at certain times as well, would you know kind of walk out of a room and be like, Whoa, "Wow!" Um, so, uh, sorry, now I've forgotten that next. The shift of yeah, I mean, right. I think um, yeah. In the film, there's there's the scene where Laura's voiceover explains um, after the Snowden disclosures, she and Assange had a phone call. Um, in which he, you know, I think that was one of the key shifts, uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, for, yeah, from Laura's perspective. Um, he was very angry, yeah? Yeah, you know, he wanted, he wanted some of the uh, Snowden documents to publish them for WikiLeaks, um, and that's, you know, that wasn't something that she was able to do. Um, and so that was a shift, and then also, um, yeah, you know, in terms of, when he when he wanted to take certain scenes out of the film, um, and when that's also something that you know that we uh, we declined to do, that was a major shift. Mm -hmm. so there's a question right there, and then we'll go to the front. Thank, thank you. Um, I think it's a really important and fascinating film. 
but I kind of have a question and also uh, uh, in some of the things that have happened since can I'm a bit disappointed about one aspect of the film and, and I'd like to ask kind of why I think there's something missing um, which is the whole point about um, Russia's involvement or possible involvement in the leaks relating to the American election. And I'd like to know whether simply um, perhaps the relationship between Laura and Julian had broken down by that point and therefore she, she wasn't able to ask this question. Um, but the only kind of... Um, because I, I would like to ask him the question, how do you feel about the possibility that the Russian government is using WikiLeaks to interfere in the election of another country? And I don't think that question is answered in the film. There's a moment in, I can't remember if it's from CNN or Fox News or uh, where he's been interviewed, and he actually, um, he does a politician's thing of answering a different question to what he's been asked. So I'd like to know, kind of. Laura you... has responded to that in, yeah. in print, hasn't yeah. she? Yeah. So I think I can I can speak to it. And she and she has. So you can you can. Um, there's some there's some work you can read about, but to speak to it directly. So you're absolutely right that um, we we absolutely were not able to film. Um, the last time we filmed directly with WikiLeaks was in. Was it? Oh, it was May, actually. It was right before Con. Mm -hmm. We like to film right before we... Yes. We like to keep filming right until we go. So at the beginning of Con, the, the scene in, in Berlin, in the London-Berlin phone call exchange between um, Sarah Harrison and uh, Julian Assange was the last time we were uh, able to film uh, with, with, with anybody, and we tried to film with Jacob Applebaum, and, and uh, that didn't happen either. So, so no, we... we very much, I, I also just want to say, very much wanted to continue constantly filming leaks. There were there were many others, but we 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 weren't able to. Um, and you know, we knew some things that we wish we could have filmed. And um, of course, what what documentary filmmaker in their right mind wouldn't want to have been, uh, you know, in the embassy filming um, as that uh, story was unfolding in in July, uh, and then into October. Um, so we don't have the answer to it. Uh, um, it answering that question is n not really the way that Laura makes um, films. Um, we uh, were not. Uh, we were certainly interested in the consequences of that, um, but n whether we know the answer or not. Um, I think was not the, the point for us in the film, but I do hope what we tried to do was raise this kind of incredible transformation of what I have thought of, at least in the United States, as the first post-Snowden election, right? The US presidential election, that is. And uh, what that world of leaks did in this kind of rapid moment where it's escalated and it's ongoing. Um, interestingly, you are the first British audience member to ask the Russia question. And I was have been telling Laura that We've, we haven't gotten that question. <laughs> so you're the first person to ask. It comes it up all the time in, in the US. US. It comes up all the time. It's the first question. <laughs> um, you're the first person who's asked it here. So I can understand it's dissatisfying. Uh, um, it's dissatisfying for you know. I would like to know the answer. Well, I also I, I'd like to um, give some give you some credit because also in the US when we get the question, it's usually did Russia do it? And I think your question is actually much deeper than that. How does Julian Assange feel? Um, about if he was, you know, or kind of, again, a character question, and, and, and it's unfortunately one that, yeah, that we can't, you know, does he feel, yeah, it's it's really a question that we wish, we really wish we could have interviewed him or, or, or had some way to answer that question, but, um, yeah, hopefully it raises the question for, for journalists, um, because it's something that, you know, then we saw in a certain way happen in the French election, right, and, and, and how, how are um, editorial rooms dealing with this uh, is really kind of, uh, the place where we kind of hope the film lends, uh, lends, lends itself to. Was there a question in the front? Oh. Okay. All the way. Hi. Um, how do you respond to the suggestion uh, that you're actually doing a bit of a hatchet job? on Assange, 
and uh, how do you rate yourselves and your own feelings in comparison to Assange and Snowden who are taking on the most powerful forces in the world and putting their lives on the line and how do you how do you compare yourselves and your concerns with what they're going through? So let me just ask you if you keep the mic. So can you just so which part of the film is a hatchet job? I think um, the, the uh, what you've said what you what you've said tonight I think amounts to a hatchet job, and I think the what have, what have we said that's a hatchet job? I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, it's a genuine. I'm not. And it's a genuine question. And what in the film is a hatchet job? By your prominence in the film to people who are attacking, uh, who are attacking Assange, the sexual, the, se the, the credit you're giving to the sexual uh, charges. Although you put you put um, you put captions up saying that no charges have been have been put. You still plant that doubt. We come away from the end of the film, and I'm a documentary film editor. Frankly, I thought the last quarter of it was beginning to fall apart. It was hard to follow it. Uh, <coughs> but but let, me, let me just go back doubt, to the hatchet. Let me go back to the hatchet. It so amounts to a hatchet job, in my opinion. That, so it's a hatchet job. How do you respond to the charge apart from, uh, 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 apart from you know, haranguing me? Sorry, apart from uh, apart, apart from uh, 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 apart okay, from attacking so, me. So now she can, okay, now she can answer. Question. So okay, so here's what I would say. Assange is in. It's a 90 minute film. He's in the film for, for you know, almost every frame of of the film, and he speaks for himself. So he, those are his words, where he is the one who says how he feels about the case. Um, we followed aspects of the case, um, uh, and I think as Laura has said publicly, it wasn't the film that she set out to make. She set out to make a film about drones, but that was what was happening, and certainly wasn't what they intended to have happen to them either. So uh, I don't think there's any possibility that this film could be considered a hatchet job. I will tell you that Assange um, didn't when I showed it to him uh, on April 1st at the embassy. Um, and so I, I just, uh, I don't think there's a basis of, of that, any basis for that um, in this film. I think it's a portrait that allows him and other people to speak for himself. We're very clear that the, uh, that there were no charges. Um, we are very careful about the language that we use. Actually, I would say compared to other journalists, there were not even, there were possible counts. Um, that it took many years for um, before the investigation was dropped. So, I, I what can I say? I disagree with her. I think this is about as this is very far from a hatchet uh, hatchet job. There's also um, an interesting assumption that the, that Laura Poitras, as a filmmaker, is somehow insignificant in relation to these other people. And in fact, with the story of Citizen Four, Laura po Poitras is part of how that story happened. Um, and the way it was delivered to the world is very much due to her efforts, which were magnificent, if you if you ask me. So I mean, I wouldn't actually um, be quite so dismissive of also the filmmaker. Well, I, thank you for adding that to it. I would also say that there's nothing about this where there's no there's nothing about what anything I've said or we've said tonight or anything that Laura says in the film about her own you know, that somehow she was making tremendous sacrifice. What she is very clear about, which was important at the time, is that um, she herself was um, being detained, which was why I think, you know, she understood and took seriously the risks that they were under. Um, and that stems from her work from, from 2006, a series of false accusations herself. So, um, but I, I think you're, you're completely right that uh, uh, she herself has an incredibly important role in this work, and Assange and Snowden are two people who she's, you know, made films about both of them. One is a whistleblower, one is a publisher. Very different roles. I actually haven't kept track of the time, but one more question. Well, it's kind is of not... Is there any woman who has a question? Oh, good. It's not 
really a question. It's just a sort of follow-on from that discussion. I mean, I, it, it's a very, to me, it was a very ambiguous film. I mean, it didn't give, you know, in terms of journalism and the tabloid media, and so we, we're used to having very strong statements, very definite statements being made about things. And this film didn't do any of that. It just kind of presented it as a picture of being moving through with, with Assange through these, these years. And so you're left with this ambiguity of, you know, what we want to know, you know, was he this, was he that, and, and yet there's no answers like that. There's no, you can't give those kind of answers. Um, and so for me, it just lived with that, that feeling of ambiguity and um, curiosity. Um, and he did say uh, that he didn't feel much. He was asked that question in the film and he said, I don't feel, you know, I don't, I'm not, for me it's more about, for him, it's, I got the sense it's more about um, how so he sees the cry, truth. Not that he didn't feel. No, he did actually yeah. use the word feel. I'm sure he did. He, said, he says <laughs> yeah. uh, he doesn't care how he feels, yes, I believe. Yes, yeah. he did use the word he doesn't care how he feels. Yeah. So that's not what's important to him, but his, his, his important, how he sees things is, is establishing what he sees is what's happening in the world, the truth, is, as he sees it, and the feeling I came away with. He's a very merc mercurial character, so he says some really important, profound mm. things, and at the same time he's also inscrutable in certain ways that yes. are uncomfortable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, anyway, it was a very uh, interesting film, <laughs> thought-provoking. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.